Well, um, I have 830. So I am going to turn it over to Chris Small and Nan Kolke from the High Education Licensure Pros, also known belovingly as HELP, because that's what we need sometimes when we are discussing professional licensure and regulation. Um, they're going to do a wonderful job today. Um, they're going to provide um, some discussion questions uh, and also answer some of your questions as well. So right now I'm going to turn it over to Chris Mall, and he will do some additional introductions. And um, again, thank you for joining us early this morning on a Monday. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, and yes, thank you all for being here on this Monday morning to kick off your week with some uh, information and discussion about licensure compliance, everyone's favorite topic, I'm sure, <laughs> a great way to kick off the week. But we are very uh, happy to be here and glad to facilitate this conversation amongst Ohio institutions today. So if you don't know me, uh, my name is Chris Mall, and I've been working in professional and occupational licensure in higher education for over 15 years. So I spent most of that time working for a large online institution, uh, out of Minneapolis called Capella University. Uh, I got to build a team of professionals who focused on this work exclusively while I was at Capella. Uh, but I know that most institutions do not have uh, the resources to do that, to have a team of people to do this work. Often it's just one of you, or maybe it's you know a fraction of your role of what you do at the institution and you've been charged with figuring out how to comply with these licensure regulations, which is even more important because of the changes coming up for this July 1st. So we're gonna dig into all that. But before we do, I wanted to let um, my business partner, Nan, introduce herself. Thanks, Chris. Hi, everyone. Good, happy Monday morning, tax day. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, I, I met Chris when I worked to at Capella University from 2010 to 2020 and uh, interacted with Chris as he was uh, working with schools, and, uh, both leadership and students. So that was uh, very helpful, particularly for our students. I worked first in specialized accreditation working across schools and then exclusively in the School of Counseling, uh, working with many of their uh, operational units, providing operational support and helping them continue to meet quality assurance standards. Prior to Capella, I worked for many years at the University of Minnesota. So I have the experience of two uh, fairly large institutions of different types. And the last three, almost three and a half years, I've been working with Chris, learning all about uh, licensure research. So back to you, Chris. Thanks, Nan. So we have an uh, hour and a half set aside today, which is fantastic because that will give us plenty of time to dig into this and get in the weeds and maybe get a little muddy and we'll come out. Uh, hopefully clean on the other side when we're all done. But uh, I'm going to do first an overview of what the Title IV regulations are related to this, along with a couple of notes about SARA policy as it applies. Uh, then we have time set aside for your questions, but please feel free to put your questions into the chat as we go today. Uh, you can also ask your questions live on video or audio, whatever your preference is. We'll take your questions in any format. Uh, and then we're going to have some discussion as a group. So as I mentioned, you know, one thing that I really appreciate about MEC organizing these uh, is they're bringing you all together by states. And we do know that there are, you know, differences in how each institution is going to approach some of this work. Um, but I do think talking it through with some colleagues, maybe, you know, similarly situated, uh, you know, in your state will be helpful. So hopefully you find it helpful too. But get those uh, discussion kind of juices starting to flow because we do really encourage all of you to participate in that when we get towards the end of our, our time together here today. And uh, yes, we can talk about some of our services as well, if that's applicable as we go along here. So I'm going to let Nan flip it over here and we'll get started on the summary. What is required? What is this work that we're talking about? So uh, some of you may have heard me uh, do this in other webinars or uh, other presentations, or you may have heard it from other sources. But again, I just wanted to provide this to set the stage to make sure we are all on the same page uh, and to give people opportunities to ask questions about these new regulations in particular going to affect July 1st. So these next few slides as I'm talking about this, I'm talking as if it's July 1st. So I'm talking about these effective things uh, now, uh, just to make that clear. So. We have existing regulations that went into effect July 1st of 2020, 
just for disclosures. And then we have these changes coming up here for July 1st. So under the federal Title IV regulations, which is where this uh, responsibility is located, uh, along with some SARA policy, there are really three responsibilities that all institutions have. So if you're a Title IV participating institution, then you have to have these three things under control at your institution. Uh, the first is you need to understand if your licensure programs meet educational requirements for professional or occupational license uh, in the state where your institution's located, so Ohio for probably all of you, and where your students are located. We're gonna dig into more of these, each of these here uh, in a moment. But that first responsibility is understanding how your programs meet educational requirements. And then we will talk about certifying, uh, what that means. Again, that's a new requirement, we'll get into that. And then finally, we'll talk about communicating. So thanks, Nam, we'll, we'll just move right along to understanding. I like that, keep me, keep me moving here this morning on Monday. All right, so understanding, uh, again, Every institution has a responsibility to understand how your licensure programs meet educational requirements uh, in every U.S. state and territory where you're recruiting students, advertising students, and in particular, enrolling students. So what is a licensure program? What does that mean? Uh, well, good question. Department of Education has not provided a definition of what a licensure program is. So uh, we have to look for some context clues and look at information they've put out uh, and then use other information as available, right? So uh, licensure as a, as a first order of business, licensure is shorthand. So this is any kind of uh, professional or occupational credential that's required to work in that profession or occupation. So something that is issued by a state or territory government entity in order for someone to work in that field. That's what licensure is. But again, we could be talking about an endorsement, an authorization, a registration, a certification, lots of different names. But the key is, is that required for employment? Is it issued by the state or territory? So that's licensure. Again, what's a licensure program? We don't have a clear definition. So we do have guidance though from Department of Education. Uh, it's any program that's been designed or advertised to lead to a professional or occupational license. And so the designed piece is important, right? How your curriculum has been developed, what kind of standards are you adhering to? Um, what are those occupations or professions that the curriculum has been designed to uh, help prepare someone to meet? And then the advertising piece is also critical. And we can talk more about this also if people have questions or wanna get into it. But really it, it is key to know and understand how your programs are being advertised on your website. Uh, if you have uh, online program manager or, or, or other third party kind of helping you with recruiting or advertising, it's really important to know how they're talking about these programs as well um, in order to know if it is indeed a licensure program or not. So again, recruiting, advertising, and enrolling, and we'll dig into those more, but those are the keys now in light of the new July 1 requirements coming online. This does apply to all modes of delivery. So something that we've been still hearing is some confusion from folks that this is only applicable to distance education or to distance programs. That is not true. These regulations apply to all types of programs, whether it's on your physical campus, a face-to-face -face program, or a fully distance online program, or some hybrid, or something in between, applies equally across the board. There are some specific considerations for distance education, and I'll get into those in a moment when I talk about the new certify responsibility. Uh, again, under, in understanding responsibility, you need to determine if it meets or does not meet the educational requirements in those states and territories where you're recruiting, advertising, and in particular, enrolling. Right now, many of you may have uh, not made a determination in many states and territories. That is completely okay under the July 1, 2020 version of these regulations. So if you have not determined, uh, you haven't gone through that exercise of trying to research what other states' requirements are and compare your programs to those, again, that is completely okay under the 2020 version. That probably is not going to be okay for your institution, at least for 
most of your uh, programs that you're offering under the July 1, 2020 tour, 2024 version. So this one coming up this July. And again, we can talk about some of these nuances here related to a face-to-face -face program versus a distance program if people have questions. But shifting gears into that second responsibility. So again, if you're participating in the Title IV program, uh, there is a new responsibility that Department of Education has added to the program participation agreement. And the PPA is essentially the master contract that every institution has to agree to in order to participate in the Title IV federal financial aid program. So the PPA itself has been around for a very long time. There are a lot of terms and conditions in that PPA that your institution agrees to in order to, to be part of the program. But this new section is being added effective this July 1st. Uh, what it requires is that every institution has to certify that your programs meet the educational requirements where your institution is located and where your students are located at the time of initial enrollment or this is the exception, or where a student attests to plan to be licensed and employed after completing the program. So the department has uh, basically set up this new requirement where institutions cannot enroll students located and it does not meet or not determined state or territory unless they complete a written attestation that says essentially, look, I really wanna be licensed and employed in this meet state after I graduate. I plan to relocate there or I plan to you know, work across state lines, whatever it is, but I plan to be licensed and employed in this meet state, not the state that I'm currently located in that does not meet or not determined. Um, and when you get the access to the slide deck, we do have um, some sample example written attestations um, that we've provided. Uh, one thing I want to point out about written attestations, along with student location policy, is these are going to be individual to each institution. Uh, so Department of Education has not dictated a particular form or format for these written attestations. We have a little bit of color around the edges from them on what they expect, um, which essentially they expect something more than just, you know, a standardized checkbox a kind of form. Uh, they expect some sort of education or conversation or something to be happening with that prospective student or applicant uh, before they actually provide you with that written attestation that says they plan to be licensed and employed in a meet state or territory. And again, we can get into details on these people of questions or if you want to spend some more time on it. But just really quickly, I wanted to go back, man, if you could go back one, I wanted to just to touch on the student location policy here uh, because we, we've had student location policies as a requirement since July 1, 2020 under those uh, regulations that exist for disclosures, but it's even more important now under these changes for this July, and it's because of this PPA certification responsibility. So again, you'll have to be able to certify that your program meets the educational requirements where that student is located at the time of initial enrollment in the licensure program. And so whatever your institution has for a student location policy now, uh, you may want to review that. If you don't know if you have a student location policy for these licensure purposes, um, you should figure that out pretty quickly uh, and maybe make that an area of focus in the near future uh, to make sure that you have them because all of these um, all of this responsibility around certifying really does hinge on your student location policy moving forward. All right, so that third responsibility, this is communicating. Uh, as I've mentioned a couple times, this responsibility has been around since July 1st of 2020, and Department of Education didn't really change a whole lot when it comes to this communicating responsibility. So you still have public disclosures and individual direct disclosures that are required. With the public disclosures, the department did make one change. So uh, 2020 version, uh, institutions were supposed to have a listing of states and territories where your program meets educational requirements, does not meet, and then all the places where you would not determined or you would not made a determination. 
we know in our work with institutions that um, a lot of you have, you know, 58 states and territories is not determined, and you're saying meets for Ohio. Again, that complies with, you know, the, the 2020 federal regulations uh, as they exist. What Department of Education did under this updated version is they're removing not determined from the public disclosures. So the new regulation language says uh, institutions must disclose where they've determined that the program meets or does not meet the educational requirements. So this does potentially still include all 59 US states and territories if you have students located in any of those or if you're advertising or recruiting for that licensure program there. And I did wanna point out this advertising and recruiting piece is not in the regulation itself. Uh, this is stemming from information that myself and others have been receiving from Department of Education staff. In particular, uh, the staff person who is assigned to field questions and respond to this particular regulation change. Her name is Vanessa Gomez. Uh, and so she's sent emails to myself and others that have focused on this advertising and recruiting piece as also being a consideration for institutions uh, when you are both you know, complying with the new certify responsibility and for the disclosure responsibility. Wanted to point out the relation to SARA policy here. So SARA policy uh, 5.2 uh, does have a connection to licensure. Um, this policy was created after the 2020 version of the federal Title IV regulations went into effect, and it's connected directly to that regulation. Um, so what the policy says, uh, you know, if you have a, a state or territory that's not determined, first, you should be making all reasonable efforts to determine if it meets or doesn't meet. And then if it's still not determined and you're going to disclose that publicly, you need to provide the board contact information as part of that. Um, quick note about Sarah policy uh, and Sarah Appel maybe can weigh in more if people have questions, but you know, um, that is in the midst of um, undergoing review. People have submitted proposals for policy modifications. And so I know there are some that have been submitted uh, to update this language in Sarah policy, but I just wanted to point it out because it does exist today and it is out there as something to keep in mind if you're a Sarah participating institution, which I think you all are on the call today. Okay, so second piece of communicating is individual direct disclosures. Uh, these are typically done through email. Uh, these are connected to student location. So as I mentioned before, you know, student location policy has been a, a consideration or a factor since July 1 of 2020, and it's even more important now under the certified responsibility. But whatever you have for your student location policy today, um, you should be applying that to determine where a prospective student or applicant is located um, at the time of initial enrollment. And then if they're located somewhere where you've not determined or it does not meet state or territory, you should be sending them uh, direct disclosure. And that's going to continue after this July 1st. Department of Ed has not changed anything about individual direct disclosures. For your current students, uh, if they relocate to a does not meet or not determined state or territory, or if something changes with the state's requirements or your program, and now you have a situation where you have students located in a does not meet place, you need to send them direct notification or direct disclosure that within 14 calendar days of becoming aware of the change. So again, this hasn't changed uh, from the 2020 version, but just pointing it out again, because it's continuing under this 2024 version, the department said disclosures are still very important. And you know we expect the institutions are continuing to comply with these uh, disclosure requirements. All right, so some of you may have heard last week about an announcement that came out from Department of Education related to these regulations. Um, basically, what the department did was uh, they made this electronic announcement that says, uh, look, we understand there may be some you know, unique uh, scenarios where institutions find that they're not able to fully comply with this new PPA certification responsibility related to licensure by July 1st. 
if an institution, for example, is trying to get some sort of uh, review by an out-of-state licensing board, or if they're waiting for a response from a board or agency to specific questions that is going to allow them to make a meets or not does not meet determination, but you know they're still waiting, haven't received a response. If, if they're in that kind of scenario, then they should document all of that very thoroughly. Uh, and then in the event that we would pursue an enforcement action after July 1st, they could use that as evidence uh, as a defense to that enforcement action. So basically saying there's a, a little wiggle room here. If you have some sort of unique circumstances that are outside of the control of your institution that prevents you from being ready by July 1st, that you have this window from July 1st to January 1st of 2025. Or again, you could have that evidence gathered and then use that uh, in an effort um, to defend against an enforcement action should that happen. So I do want to make clear this is not a blanket delay of the effective date. Uh, it is not a delay of the effective date in any means. The These new regulations are effective July 1st, um, but they've provided this potential option for some institutions, again, with very specific scenarios outside of the control of the institution. And I also wanted to note that this only applies to the new PPA certification that certify responsibility. It does not apply to the public or direct disclosures. So everybody should, you know, have your public disclosures out and have that process for direct disclosures and have that active by July 1st. Uh, so if there is some enforcement action against your institution by the department after that date, they would expect that your public and direct disclosures are fully compliant by July 1st. All right, so that's all I wanted to uh, formally run through as part of a uh, overview summary, if you will. And this time, again, we've set it aside uh, plenty of time for questions. So if anyone has questions about anything I just went over, or if you have questions about something else, related to these regulations, please, again, feel free to ask those uh, over video or audio, or if you want to put them in the chat. I know Nan and Sarah are, are helping keep tabs on what's coming in the chat, too. Nobody wants to be first, huh? That's when I use the chalkboard and write people's names up there. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Looks like maybe we have something in the chat here. Um, Wendy's asking, does the advertising need to be program specific? So that is a great question, Wendy. Um, the department, again, this advertising stuff is not in the new regulation language itself. Uh, it's not even really covered in the commentary, which is what the Department of Education releases with the final regulations, but rather this is coming from department staff in response to questions. So we're not sure, but uh, everything's kind of pointing to that it is program specific. So I don't think the department intends to limit an institution's ability to advertise for their institution broadly or to advertise for non-licensure programs uh, in a particular state or territory. The intention is that institutions are only advertising for that particular licensure program in states where they know that they meet the educational requirements. That seems to be the, the department's intent here. And I will mention that, uh, fingers crossed, this week we should be getting some written guidance from Department of Education in the form of a question and answer or some sort of documentation like that. Um, some, maybe some of you even on the call were at the NASAPS conference last week. Uh, Wesley Whistle, who's a Department of Education staff, was there and he mentioned that the department would be releasing uh, this additional guidance on this topic very soon. So this week, um, if not this week, probably next week, it seemed like barring something major you know, changing uh, for the department, which is which is hard to know these days, right? <laughs> With everything happening there, but uh, we should see some more soon. So uh, I'm thinking that there will be something about advertising in 
the department's written guidance that they put out. So I know that we'll be taking a look at that closely and would encourage you know, all institutions to take a look at that as soon as it's available. Thanks, Chris. We do have another question in the chat <clears throat> from Lisa. Can you explain the process of making a determination? Do we send our curriculum to each state territory and they make the determination or is it another process? Yeah, thank you for that question. That's a great one too. So in our experience, there are very few state and territory licensing boards or agencies that will evaluate an out-of-state program and give you some sort of, you know, approval or um, affirmative, you know, statement that your program meets their educational requirements. There are very few that do that. So what the process is typically is that an institution needs to research what the educational requirements are for those other states and territories where you're enrolling students or recruiting and advertising. And then you need to have someone who knows your curriculum and your program very well compare your program uh, to those particular educational requirements for that state or territory. This could be something as high level as do you have programmatic accreditation, right? So some professions or occupations are really all kind of consolidated around particular accreditors for programs. If your program holds that accreditation, then you may meet all educational requirements. This is going to vary by program and by state and territory. For others, it will be a very detailed comparison of your classes, you know, practicum or internship or student teaching or some other supervised experience hours in the program. Um, comparing those to the other state standards or requirements, even down to the assignment level sometimes for some of these license types in some states. So um, it can be a very heavy lift for this work. I should say it is a very heavy lift for this work, depending on, you know, how many programs your institution offers, um, who's going to be doing the work, um, all those considerations. But it does take a, a very considerable amount of time and effort to make these determinations. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> Does the NASDAQ interstate agreement have any bearing on this at all? Yes, thanks for that question too. So Department of Education in their commentary, which again, they released with the final version of the regulations, their responses to all, well, not all, but <laughs> a good portion of the public comments that they received uh, when they you know, released the proposed regulations. So in the commentary, the department did talk about um, different compacts and reciprocity agreements as they apply to licensure. And the example that they used specifically was around a teacher. So someone being able to complete a teacher preparation program in one state and then apply for their teacher license or credential in another state. The example they give, they talk about, well, we understand there's scenarios where that uh, license applicant would only be able to receive a provisional or like a temporary type license until they complete, you know, one very specific state course for the new state. But we're, the department said, you know, we're okay with that approach. Um, we know that that person could work as a teacher by using that out of state program and going through that kind of provisional licensing process using the reciprocity agreement. And you know, we think that's reasonable that an institution would say that their program meets another state's requirements in those scenarios. So that's long, long roundabout way of me saying yes, the NASDAQ interstate agreement and other licensing compacts or reciprocity agreements can be a factor that institutions use when making your meets determinations. I do want to put some caution out here though. Uh, again, I'm hoping that we get some more clarity from this written guidance that the department should be releasing soon. Um, it seems like what they're really talking about is the ability for someone to get licensed in the other state, not just to be able to practice or work across state lines. Um, there are some compacts that are just focused on facilitating practice across state lines and would not help a new graduate of a program to actually achieve a license in another state or territory. So again, we can dig in more into that if people have questions, but the NASDAQ interstate agreement for educators is a pretty unique one in that 
it does have mechanisms for new graduates of programs to earn a license in the other state. So that's a good, good consideration. Um, I will say, again, <laughs> keep in mind that it should be a factor in a consideration. And department has said, you know, it's up to the institutions to understand how that process works in each state or doesn't work. And the institutions responsible for making that meets or does not meet determination. And basically the institution's liable if they're making the wrong determinations. The department staff have indicated that as well. So I would proceed with caution uh, and just thoroughness when it comes to relying on interstate agreements and compacts. Chris, there are quite a few follow-up questions on that. <clears throat> and Dan, I'm gonna get to yours in a minute, but first I'm gonna do some follow-up on what you just talked about. This requirement, first of all, only applies to Title IV approved programs, right? It's for Title IV programs, correct. Okay, and if even if you determine that the educational requirements match, doesn't there need to be a formal approval process from the other state's licensing board? Again, that's really not how it works for most professions and occupations. The out-of-state licensing boards and agencies have no mechanism to review and approve out-of-state programs. There are some exceptions, of course, but in general, that's just not how it works. So it is up to each institution to be comparing your program and, you know, again, using all information you have available, make that determination yourselves if it meets or doesn't meet. If we are not advertising or recruiting in other states, how does that impact our responsibility to comply with these requirements? Right. So Department of Ed has said, if an institution is not advertising or recruiting or enrolling students located in other states, then you don't have a responsibility to make any determination. So it's plausible that there could be uh, certain programs at your institution where you're truly only enrolling people located in Ohio, you're not advertising it anywhere else. And so you would only have to make that meets determination for Ohio. And then the rest of the 58 states and territories could be not determined, which again, you would not have to disclose on your public disclosures any longer after July 1, 2024, or you could choose to still disclose that. We know that some institutions are choosing to continue to disclose where they've not made a determination just to make sure that you know interested people or prospective students have that information available uh, to them on their website. Okay, great. Let's go to a couple of hands raised and I will get back to these questions. So go ahead, Amy. Amy, are you on mute? I know you're on mute. Are you talking? <laughs> Amy Leone. Okay. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't have a question. Oh, you didn't, okay. Then let's go to uh, Adam. Yeah, this is Adam from uh, Miami University. Uh, can everyone hear me? Can yes. Hear you. Okay, great. Uh, going off the question that was just asked, just for clarification, uh, because it wasn't clear to me when I read the regs, if we so if we have a profession a program leading professional licensure that is fully face to face, and you know doesn't have an online doesn't isn't offered as like an online program, we don't have to make a determination for the yeah for you know for yes or no on each state on our publicly accessible website uh because we're not you know we aren't recruiting or advertising an online program in other states it, so it's kind of piggybacking off the last question it, it, would that be true <laughs> so i'm i'm going to clarify a little adam it's less about the modality and more about your student location policy and where your students and prospective students are located, if that makes sense. Okay, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that again, 
kind of everything stems from the student location policy now. This is why it's so critical, especially because of this new PPA certification responsibility. If your policy treats prospective students for a face-to-face campus-based program as if they're already located in Ohio at the time of initial enrollment, then yes, it's possible that you would not need to uh, be making determinations for any of the other states or territories. But again, it's really critical what your student location policy says and how it treats all of your prospective students, okay. right? That, that's and, um, very helpful. That's very helpful. Thank you. Sure. Another consideration, uh, just again, geography is important here. So I know there's, you know, several of you that have um, possibly commuter students who, yes, they're going to be doing a face-to-face campus-based program. But, you know, if you're really close to one of those borders with Indiana or Kentucky or whatever, um, you want to consider that as well uh, as you're crafting your student location policy and thinking about your processes around applying that process, that policy to different groups. So, you know, it may not be reasonable to treat a commuter student for a face-to-face program as if they're located in Ohio, if they're going to be taking online courses as well, right? If it's not, if it's not, everything's not happening in person, if there's online courses happening, you may want to think about that as you're crafting that policy and figuring out your processes around that. Great. Thank you. So, Chris, Dan uh, put this question up in the chat a while ago. You mentioned differences regarding online and in-person programs. Can you expand? You, you've talked a little bit more about it already, Dan. I don't know if you have any more specific of a question, but Chris, can you expand? Right. So I know uh, this is important to keep in mind that Department of Education did include distance education in the final regulation language of this PPA certification responsibility. So if you've read the actual regulation language, which we have as a um, addendum slide here at the end, but um, what it says is that institutions need to determine, or sorry, yes, institutions need to determine if your programs meet the educational requirements where your institution is located and where your distance education students are located. So the reason that I don't frame it that way is because I think then people get so narrowly focused on your distance education programs, but that's not the department's intent here. The definition that they're using for distance education comes from the May 2023 Dear Colleague letter that states if the student's taking one or more class online, then they're distance education. So we know that practically, you know, a lot of institutions have opportunities for students to take some sort of courses online. Uh, Department staff have said they're really concerned about the first term of enrollment in the licensure program. So if you have opportunities for students to take one or more class online, whether it's a gen ed class or, you know, more of a major or program specific class, um, it doesn't matter. Anything that, any kind of class that they're taking during that first term of enrollment, uh, if they can do that online, then that kind of kicks them into this distance education bucket under the PPA certification responsibility. So that's why I'm I'm always talking about it as, you know, you really need to focus on your student location policy and how that's treating all of your students, no matter the modality of the program. And then you do need to think about, you know, the online component, but really it's more about if you have any online classes available to any student, whether they're coming onto your campus or a commuter student or whomever, um, you probably need to make that determination if their program meets or doesn't meet for wherever they're located. So hopefully that makes sense. I think that's, I, I'm just really frustrated the department threw in that distance education phrase uh, because the definition that they're using really makes it much more broad than distance education programs. It can really apply to many campus face-to-face programs as well. Again, depending on your institution and and how you have things set up. Thanks, Chris. I'm gonna go back just so we don't, I don't miss these. And 
there are a couple of questions about back to making determinations. And then there are, we'll go back to quite a few around um, border states and online versus in person. So first though, uh, does anyone have, or can we collaboratively collect a complete list of licensure programs to start with? Good question. Yeah, right. I wish, you know, we, we are still working to build out a complete listing of licensure programs in every U.S. state and territory. And I don't even want to project how long it will take us because every time we kind of get further along, then we realize there's a lot more out there that, that we haven't, especially when you think about all the occupations that are licensed along with professions, um, you know, when we're talking about things that require an associate's degree or less, you know, it's just astronomical, the, the amounts of things that are out there. So uh, we're not aware of a complete listing that anyone has. I think collaborating with other institutions is a great idea to share information. So especially, you know, if you're offering similar programs related to potentially the same license types, you know, definitely ask your colleagues, hey, have you found that there's a license for this or um, that state that where are they licensing it, right? Which states are they licensing it in? So collaboration is important. Um, there are some resources that would be a starting point. And so I apologize, I don't have a quick way to reference that, but I know that we can we can get that out. Um, maybe Nan, I'll put you on the spot. If you're able to pull some of those links, sure. like to, uh, yeah. So we'll get some stuff in the chat for starting points. Great, <clears throat> here's another one. If we do our determination in good faith, how could we possibly be held liable? Plus, things may change in other states that might not be readily posted or communicated, so the fault cannot fall on us for not updating. Please clarify. Yeah, I, I think that when I was mentioning liability, that was specifically in relation to relying on compacts and reciprocity agreements. Uh, and again, this is coming from Department of Education staff as email responses uh, to myself and others. So what they were saying is that Compacts and reciprocity agreements, you know, again, can be a factor as you're doing your research and making determinations, uh, but that you should be sure you are really understanding how that compact or reciprocity agreement is going to allow your graduates to achieve a license and be eligible for employment in those other states. So I guess the shorthand way of saying that is I don't think it would be wise to simply rely on the fact that there's a compact that exists for a profession and then across the board say, oh yes, we meet all of these other states and territories because Ohio participates in that compact and all of those other states do too. Because there could be some nuance there, um, some things that would only come to light if an institution actually still dug in you know, and researched a little more carefully what each of those compact states are doing uh, with those Ohio applicants that come forward. Okay, Chris, I'm just gonna walk through these chats and if someone wants to raise their hand, we can sure go back and forth. <clears throat> if the college is near a state border, where often students enroll, especially with tuition reciprocity agreements between the states, even if we don't advertise, must we assure licensure pathways exist? So this is gonna come back to again, how does your student location policy treat these students? And probably also what kind of program this is. Um, this is where maybe the distance factor could come into play. But again, your student location policy should clearly dictate where someone is located at the time of initial enrollment. And in this scenario, uh, if it's a commuter student, it may be that they're located in the other state based on, again, whatever factors you're going to use, whether that's a permanent address or a mailing address or an address where they're going to be residing when they're taking classes, or maybe it's in Ohio because maybe you're using some other factor to determine location, such as, you know, where is the learning taking place, um, which may be Ohio if it's a campus-based face-to-face program without any online courses as part of it. So whatever your student location policy says, 
they're located, you would have to be able to say our program meets the educational requirements where that prospective student or applicant is located in order to enroll them, unless they provide the written attestation. So you could have a border state situation where your program doesn't meet the educational requirements. You could still enroll those commuter students as long as they're attesting to the fact that they want to seek a license and employment in a meet state, Ohio, or some other meet state or territory. Hopefully that makes sense. But again, it is going to depend on the institution student location policy, which is a little bit weird to think that we could have, you know, some pretty big inconsistencies uh, depending on how institutions set up your student location policy and your processes around that. As I read your questions, please feel free to uh, come on off mute and ask a follow up or ask for any clarification. Uh, okay, here's one from Catherine. Wouldn't you have to consider where the students plan to reside after graduation, even for a face-to-face -face program? That's a good question. So I think in the regulation itself and uh, the commentary and information we have available, um, the department is not, not placing an obligation on institutions to ask every single prospective student uh, where they plan to seek licensure employment or where they plan to be located after they graduate. I don't see that as a responsibility. However, I will say we know that there are institutions that are planning to take that approach um, so that they're building into their processes, you know, uh, getting that information from applicants or prospective students on the front end to say, where do you plan to be licensed and employed after you graduate the program? and then providing that information through a disclosure as well. So those institutions could end up you know, providing disclosures for more than one state, depending on what the student says. But again, the key will be for that PPA certification piece that they'll have to be able to, the institution will have to be able to say the program meets where that student is located at the time of initial enrollment in the program. Okay, great, Chris, thanks. <clears throat> uh, I don't know why I have a frog in my throat. You're the one doing all the talking. <laughs> um, let me see, from Lisa, is there something we need to put in writing that attests that we don't recruit outside of our region that helps us to communicate that reality or is it a detail we include in our student location policy? Mm. Yeah, so, uh, I, again, I don't think there's an affirmative responsibility to put something like that in your student location policy or um, even to provide that information uh, like proactively to the department, but it certainly is a good idea to be documenting that, right? So that if there ever would be an audit or uh, should someone ask you about your recruiting or advertising processes, the more you can have documented, the better. Um, so that if you are not currently recruiting or advertising in other states uh, to create that list of those states and then have that as part of your document documentation that you're saving for all of this work, I think would be an excellent idea. And we haven't really touched on documentation yet. I did a little bit when we were talking about making the determinations, but documentation is going to be critical for all of this. So whoever at your institution is going to be comparing your programs to this other state and territory's educational requirements, definitely you need to create some documentation around that and retain it so that you have it in the event uh, that there should ever be an audit or questions from the department. You want to be able to produce that specific evidence of, you know, here was our research at the time, what we were finding for the educational requirements, here's what our program was at the time, so here's this person, you know, our faculty or program director who reviewed things and compared them, and here's how they made that meets determination. To have all that laid out clearly, I think will be very important if there is an audit, um, they're going to want to see how you got to a meets conclusion. Or if you're relying on a compact or reciprocity agreement, 
again, document that all in writing and have that retained so that you can have it available should it be needed. Chris, does the student attestation component apply only to students new to programs on or after July 1? Yes, this is not retroactive. So starting this July 1, uh, anyone who's initially enrolling in a licensure program on July 1 or after who is located in a does not meet or not determined state or territory, you would need to have a written attestation from them in order to enroll. Um, understandable question here about risk. Of course, my institution plans to be fully compliant, but in terms of risk, where is the real risk in noncompliance? Is it the de Department of Ed finding out and sanctioning us, or is the real risk students thinking they were not given appropriate disclosures and suing us? Mm. That is a great question. I mean, unfortunately, those are both real risks. Um, I think you know, with this electronic announcement that the department put out last week, it's kind of also signaling to me that uh, they are expecting institutions to be compliant by July 1st. We'll have to see what that means practically. Um, if, you know, there, there are any kind of enforcement actions taken. I'll also say, again, being at the NASAPS conference last week and, and hearing from uh, Wesley Whistle, one of the staff members for Department of Ed, you know, the department has a lot of things going on right now, and I'm sure many of you are um, feeling the effects of all of the changes in other capacities and, of course, the delays with FAFSA and, you know, everything else that's happening. So it's a little hard to project kind of the timeline of, of where the department's focus is going to be around enforcement of any of these new things in the future, um, but I would say there is a risk, just like any other Title IV responsibility. These requirements should be treated with the same, um, you know, the same level of attention that your institution treats any other kind of Title IV responsibility or provision, because it is all part of part of the Title IV requirements. Now that's where this hook is. So uh, that's not really a helpful answer, but I would say that's maybe a lens to approach it from, right? So how are you handling compliance with any of the other facets of Title IV? Kind of what's your uh, appetite or tolerance for risk with those? And then use that as consideration for how you're approaching this work. Okay, again, feel free to raise your hand or come off mute. A uh, couple on on this level, does licensing always take place at the state level or is there such a thing as licensing at the national level? And then a follow-up to their uh, a comment, there is a national licensure available in teacher prep. Yeah, so this is a good question too. Um, we have things that are issued by national organizations or uh, private organizations that can seem like a license. Like they can seem like uh, something that allows someone to work in a profession, because sometimes there is a connection between the two. So uh, like the national credential to be a nationally certified teacher is an example. That is a private issued certification that some states incorporate as a requirement or a qualification uh, to achieve a license to teach in their state or to move up kind of a level of license in their state. So they're not the same. The short answer is there's no national license. There's not. But there are these things that look like maybe they could be a license or they could have an actual connection to a state or territory issued license in some way. So another example would be like a dietitian. That's a profession where for most states and territories, people have to earn a private issued uh, certification or registration first from, again, a private organization but then states and territories have adopted that as part of their standards to meet the educational requirements for a license to practice. So they are distinct. There will be a connection in some of these cases where you'll have to know about that national certification or credential or whatever it is, but that's not the end of the story. You still have to figure out your real answer is, can our graduates earn that state issued license in order to practice or, or work in the field. 
All right, I, one last question in the chat uh, for now from John. Is there any responsibility to inform current students who may switch programs to a program that, that does not meet licensure requirements in that state? Or if students move to a different state uh, where the program does not meet licensure requirements? Yes, there is a responsibility under the direct disclosures. So you would have 14 calendar days from whenever that student changes programs or changes locations, and now it's a does not meet scenario. And again, that direct disclosure responsibility really hasn't changed. Um, but if you're not sure what your processes are around that, you'll wanna look into that pretty quickly so that you can have that in place before July 1. So I guess follow up on the question, so students move and they don't tell us. Is that is it only 14 days after we're informed that they've moved? Is that how yeah, that works? Yeah, it's, four, it's 14 days of the institution becoming aware of the change, okay. right? So I will say, John, though, um, I think institutions will want to, again, back to student location policy, you'll want to make sure in the student location policy there is some... Um, mention or mechanism or responsibility placed on the students to inform you when they're changing locations, right? So that's another thing to, to keep in mind. Again, the processes related to the student location policy are so important. Um, how or when are you going to ask current students to confirm their location or update you on location? I think it's wise to have that process in place. Some institutions are incorporating it into course registrations, either for every single term or once a year. Um, you know, others, again, are, are maybe figuring out an annual cadence on when they're asking students to confirm location. But at a minimum, I would say in the student location policy, you should place responsibility on students to let you know when they have changed locations. All right, thank you. No more questions in the chat. Anyone want to go off mute and ask? I was gonna say, otherwise, oh, we got one and then um, we're almost right on time, man, to shift into the poll and discussion. So I see Yolanda, you have your hand up, go ahead. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Sorry, my voice is going away, too. I was just wondering, and you mentioned something at the beginning, which sort of piqued my mind. If we're working with an OPM or several OPMs, the onus is basically on us if they botch something, correct? We are the ones yes. that the government would say, you did something wrong, and the penalties would be levied at us. Yes, that is correct, Yolanda. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, if you're willing, we have a poll. Uh, we would like to know what is your biggest challenge with implementation? So, right, we just talked through quite a few things. Um, if you've never done a Slido before, you can do it one of two ways, scan the QR code with your mobile device right now. It'll pull up the poll for you to answer, or you can go to slido.com and type in 256106 and answer the question. And then in just a moment, Nan will click on this present link and we'll be able to see your responses as they're coming in live here. But this is setting the stage for our discussion, which is gonna happen next around uh, some of these implementation challenges and successes. If any of you have successes you want to share, those are of course welcome too. So we've got a few responses coming in. Again, you can uh, scan the QR code there if you want to participate or go to slido.com and type in the numbers there, 2561206. So, so far we're seeing the biggest challenge is researching the educational requirements in other states and territories. We've got a, a some of you who are experiencing limited support from your leadership, which I know can be a challenge getting 
getting started and getting resources for this work if you don't have that support. Some of you haven't started this yet, so you don't know about the challenges. Um, I'm glad you're here today. Hopefully this will be helpful as you uh, figure out when to kick off this work for your institution. All right, so it uh, looks like the clear winner here is researching the educational requirements in other states and territories. This definitely is a challenge, as I mentioned before, very time consuming uh, involved work and uh, a heavy lift, especially if it's really on the shoulders of one or just you know a, a few people at an institution. So thank you all for participating in the poll. I think this is kind of a good segue into the discussion portion. So uh, we do have a few questions that Nan will uh, eventually get up here on the, the screen, but maybe before we do, I would love to know any of you who have been doing that research work for your institution, or if you're coordinating that effort uh, and others you know, from the programs are doing the work, if you'd be willing to share kind of your process around that, how you're tackling researching those educational requirements in other states. If you don't, if you prefer not to, to come on camera or audio, feel free to put that in the chat also. But would love to hear from anyone if you've been engaged in this uh, for a while, or if you are just getting started, what your process is going to be. Thanks, Wendy. Go ahead. Yeah, so, I mean, we're looking seriously at that uh, bookmark tool um, as, a, as a starting point. Great. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, the bookmark is an online database of educational requirements for licensure uh, for all 59 states and territories. It's our online database, so Higher Education Licensure Pros created it. Um, we realized that, you know, the researching piece was one of the biggest challenges for most institutions, especially those that don't have a team of uh, folks to do this work. So uh, we launched that last year and do have a, a number of institutions, some from Ohio even already, that are members of the bookmark and are able to use that as basically a library of information uh, so that you can go there to get what the educational requirements are for the different professions and occupations. And I promise this isn't meant to be uh, an advertisement, but if people have more questions on what the bookmark is or how institutions are using it, you know, feel free to ask us now or later. Chris, this is Sarah. Um, how often is the bookmark tool updated? I know that um, has been a question in some of, of our other uh, help meetings related to uh, state license or licensure. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. So uh, we're on an annual cadence, uh, meaning that every license type, we have over 70 now, and we're adding to that over time. We do a wholesale refresh of that research on an annual basis. It's kind of a rolling calendar because again, there are so many license types, but we also uh, track pending and proposed changes and then update the bookmark within that year time span for that license type. If there's a finalized uh, rule or you know a bill that get, gets passed and that legislation is going to impact that license type. So um, it's it, we, we try to say that we are uh, our efforts are to get it done as close to real time as possible. Again, if there's a final change in the regulation or uh, past legislation, um, but you know, there's so much of it and it, it's very challenging to capture all those things. So that's why we have that annual wholesale refresh review that we do as well so that we can um, catch anything that, that has come through in the course of the year. And I will note that uh, Department of Ed has not specified a time frame for institutions where you need to, you know, update your public disclosures, for example, or update your research and comparisons to make that certify or certification. 
through the PPA. There's no specific time frame, um, but we do know that there are quite a few things connected to an annual reporting calendar related to Title IV. So when we work with institutions, you know, that's our recommendation is to at least have some sort of annual process where you're um, reviewing that research again and your program comparisons, just in case something has changed within the year um, so that you can have that updated accordingly. And then of course, you may need to do some direct disclosures if something's changed to does not meet and you need to update your students located there within 14 calendar days. All right, I'm gonna throw out another question then. Uh, anyone wanna talk about your student location policy? So again, many of you may currently have a student location policy that you put into place sometime shortly before or after July of 2020 uh, related to the disclosures for licensure. Anyone wanna share what your policy is now? And maybe are you thinking about updating it in light of the new uh, PPA certification responsibility? Hi, Kate. I see your hands up. Go ahead. Thank you. Hi. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So I'll try to share a little bit here. We are still revising our current student location policy. The one that we did to be in compliance for 2020 is fairly brief. We did take the approach of, you know, the quote unquote address we capture for the student in our SIS is where we understand them to be primarily located for the purposes of, and we're almost entirely online. So that's probably important to know. Um, we did establish that what a formal notification of a change of location is, and that that has to be something done through our specific systems. Um, we are looking to expand it quite a bit. Um, and we're working with different groups on campus, but we're looking at adding definitions. And I think I've been on some other calls where folks have talked about that as well. You know, what do we mean by initial time of enrollment? You know, if we're not, if the department is allowing us to set that, you know, obviously it has to be reasonable, right? But, you know, mm -hmm. we're trying to kind of work with admissions and IE and financial aid and make sure, okay, well, what do you guys understand this to be? Um, you know, maybe our student location policy, maybe we need one that's more specific to state authorization. And, you know, we say we're not trying to encompass how you report for, um, you know, residential requirements or for IBHEDS reporting. Um, we're working with a group that on campus that works with military students. So we understand that. Um, our Office of International Students so that when we have applicants who, you know, they are located in another country, but they're coming to the U.S. that we know where they are at the right time to make that evaluation. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really expanded. We've also um, added a section on how we understand um, their location for the purpose of professional licensure so that we've got a whole paragraph we're proposing to add for that. Um, it also, we're looking at adding some information specific to um, their field experiences or experiential learning, you know, clinical. I think one thing that is getting maybe a little bit circular with these new PPA requirements, but, you know, there's still some licensure boards that require you to get a separate approval, like from a board of nursing to even offer the program, whether or not it leads to licensure. So, you know, we are always sort of also working to make sure we don't have students trying to do clinicals in places that they should not be doing clinicals. Um, so it's been kind of a long process and just really making sure we're not 
trying to set up something that's going to mess up another office's processes that can stand alone, that people um, can explain and live with. We do um, notify our students of the policy every fall. Um, we send an email out to them and it links to the policy and it also reminds them to update their location in our system. So we do get some questions. We know students are, are reading it. We get address changes at that point. Um, but yeah, we're really trying to kind of you know, I always tell people like, we don't want to get in the business of ankle monitoring students. You know, we looked at IP, I mean, they can get around all that stuff. And it's, you know, and then it's like, well, if you're 40% of the time here and you're, you know, 60% here and it gets very, it can get very convoluted very quickly. So um, that's kind of where we are with the process. We're, we're in draft, we're meeting with different groups, and then we will um, have legal take a final review. That's what we're thinking. So I, I, you know, I'm hoping it's ready by July 1st. I don't know if that will, we might be a little late. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Kate. And, you know, you definitely brought up a lot of great things for people to consider. It is so important to not think about this in a vacuum, right? Because it absolutely is going to impact um, other processes, other departments, other ways that location is used at your institution. So um, thanks for that great, great example, Kate, and the information about the work that you're doing at your institution. I will say one question that we, we have gotten quite a bit is um, like the tuition residency consideration piece, which may apply to some of you here. So there, um, in the examples that we provided, the written attestation student location policy document, you'll see one of the student location policies uh, specifically says, you know, this is not meant to um, dictate a student's location for tuition residency purposes. So keep, just an example of keeping in mind how these um, can play out with these other factors and that you can explicitly, you know, say that in the student location policy and carve out what this is used for, what the purpose is for, uh, and that it's not going to be applied for these other purposes, as Kate was mentioning, right? iPads reporting or whatever else it is, um, there could be other policies in place to cover those considerations. Anyone else have uh, anything you want to share about student location policy? Questions that you want to throw out to others in the group, how they're tackling different scenarios related to their student location policy? Chris, this is Sarah. Um, someone had already mentioned uh, military connected students. Um, I know that Ohio has a lot of um, military connected students and folks in the Army and, and Reserves and National Guard. Can you maybe just touch upon a little bit about um, what that would mean for those folks who are, um, you know, moving around the country uh, related to professional licensure, because sometimes that can be sticky. And also if they're overseas, um, they might be taking a course at your institution, um, but they're say in Germany. Um, mm -hmm. How would one go and, and approach that situation? Yeah, great question. Thanks, Sarah. So uh, unfortunately, Department of Education, I don't think fully considered how uh, this new regulations, in particular the new PPA certification responsibility, would be applied or impact military affiliated students. So, again, with the new PPA certification responsibility, you can only enroll if someone is located in a meet state or territory, US state or territory, or if they complete that written attestation that says they're going to seek a license and employment in one particular meets state and territory after completing the program. So the possible issues with military affiliated students, right, are they don't know <laughs> where they're gonna be located after they complete a program uh, in, in a lot of instances, right? So maybe they might have some inkling like a short list of states or territories where they could be, um, but it's probably gonna be really challenging for them to be able to pinpoint this one particular meet state or territory where they plan to seek a license and employment. I don't really have an answer for that. I mean, I think this is again, a uh, something that the department wasn't considering, 
when they came up with the regulation and their, um, you know, their ideas around implementation of that, that the written attestation has to be for one particular meets state or territory. It couldn't list five potential ones, right? It has to, has to say the one. Um, and then the other complication is what if someone's not located in the U S so um, again, I'm going to point back to your student location policy. So how does your student location policy treat different types of people enrolling in a program that are living outside of the U.S.? So um, it may treat someone who's military affiliated differently than someone who is a non-U.S. citizen living outside of the U.S. It might treat a non-military U.S. citizen living abroad differently than either one of those. So Again, you can set up your policy so that you have uh, different populations of students who are treated, a, for lack, I mean, treated differently, for lack of a better word. Um, the department just says that you have to apply the policy itself consistently, meaning that once you have your uh, different populations set up and, and kind of the factors for that and what you're using to base the address on, you have to apply that consistently. Um, so it is okay to have different student populations that you're treating a little bit differently under your policy itself, if that makes sense. So I, I know I've heard from institutions that uh, for military affiliated um, students that they're setting up their policy so that uh, they're going to treat them as located in the U.S. state or territory that the student gives them, basically. So what does that student consider their, you know, permanent U.S. address at the time of initial enrollment? Again, this is kind of a, a point in time consideration, the time of initial enrollment in the program. Uh, some are going to consider them located where the campus is located. Um, some do, again, do other things. But um, this is applicable for any, again, any Title IV um, program, any student enrolling in the Title IV program. So it's not necessarily about a student accessing Title IV funds. Uh, it's about how the program is able or not to participate in Title IV funding for it. So I just throw that out there because, again, if you have a non-U.S. citizen internationally, right, living outside of the U.S., but they're enrolling in one of these licensure programs, uh, technically, all of this would still apply for them, but you're going to have to use whatever your student location policy says as far as location. If they're not located in the U.S. under your policy, then there's nothing for you to compare to or to make a determination because the responsibility is specific to U.S. states and territories. That was a very long-winded answer. I went lots of, lots of directions there, hopefully. <laughs> didn't get lost in the in the mud but very good questions and and things that we've heard from institutions before around international students and military students there is a question in the chat chris but first any follow up on that any follow up question to dealing with military students Okay, so switching uh, topics <clears throat> and kind of going back to a previous one. So Pat, so on July 1 and, and beyond, we can still have unable to determine on our website, right? But can you speak a little more about how that might work? Right, so under the public disclosures, again, for the July 1, 2024 version, the Department of Ed removed the not determined list. So you're not responsible anymore for having that list of not determined or undetermined states up on your public disclosures. You may want to still include it, uh, especially if you're gonna be in that scenario where your list of states where you are making a determination is pretty short. You know, you may wanna still disclose those places where you haven't made a meets or does not meet determination. Keep in mind, again, department's expectation is you're only going to be recruiting and advertising for those licensure programs 
where you know that they meet the education requirements. And certainly you can only enroll prospective students or applicants if they're located in a meets. Um, but keeping those things in mind, uh, you can certainly continue to have those not, not determined or undetermined uh, listings up on your public disclosures. I, I think some institutions are choosing to do that, again, just to have kind of more full information available to prospective students and students. Um, and because, you know, some of you already have it on your website right now, some of you, so it may not be a change or adding anything, it would just be um, continuing that practice that you've already got in place under the 2020 version. Thanks, Chris. No other questions in the chat. Great. I'll try one other discussion question here. Again, uh, I know it's hard sometimes in large groups to speak up, but uh, I do think it's helpful to hear from other institutions, you know, what, what you all are planning to do to try to tackle some of this. So um, I'm wondering if any of you have created something for a written attestation yet or if you haven't actually created it, if you just kind of have in mind uh, how you're gonna tackle that um, opportunity. So again, the department has created this, it's meant to be an exception so that institutions can still enroll uh, prospective students from these does not meet or not determined states or territories if they're actually planning to work somewhere else after they complete the program. And it should be some sort of, uh, process or some communication happening around those licensure outcomes and limitations uh, in addition to the actual written attestation itself. Anybody want to share what you're thinking or if you've started creating it, what, what you've got so far? Go ahead, Wendy. Yeah, so we're thinking that when students apply, you know, they different programs have different requirements. They might have a letter of references or, you know, different things like that. So we're just thinking in that system for students that are in another state that are wanting a program that we would just include that as another form they have to submit when they apply. Does that make sense? Like just in the workflow, we use Slate, that that would kick off another form to them uh, to fill out. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, I think that, <laughs> That's I think a that definitely, <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. And that is a good point, Wendy. Um, you know, you will want to make sure that this written attestation is retained in that student's record. Right. So okay. the Department of Yeah, Department of Ed has said, you know, we can ask you for these. So we could ask you to produce the written attestations for these students that you've enrolled in this program that are located in and does not meet or not determine place. So I think it's great to have it um, as part of an automated process that already exists around, you know, admission or enrollment to the program, and then making sure that that is retained in that student's record. If you do need to produce it in the future, it would be available. Thanks, Chris. <clears throat> I, I mean, and thanks, Wendy. <laughs> um, I was distracted here. I have a, a direct message just to clarify that the current Sarah policy, there is, it's still current that Sarah requires institutions to make best efforts to make a determination. And if you do put, have not determined and continue to put that to provide the licensure board contact information. Yes, that is current Sarah policy, correct. Okay. Anybody um, for the written attestations, is anyone currently, or do you plan to have some sort of uh, like advisor or um, someone in, on your admissions team have conversation about licensure? I'm just curious. I know, uh, again, could be something that you haven't thought of or don't have the resources to do, but we have heard from institutions in other states uh, that they're starting to think about creating a more robust kind of um, conversation or dialogue around licensure as part of that admission process.
Well, I'll, I'll take the silence as a no, or just not, not wanting to share in the moment, which is totally fine either way. So it is a um, Monday morning. I do see that. I know. And, and we have been going a long time. And so I was just going to say, I, I want to thank you all for being here today and for your uh, attention and participation. We do have uh, one other poll. Um, so Nan just pulled up our uh, additional services slide, which uh, we had already mentioned the bookmark. We also work with institutions in other ways as well. Um, but we do have one other poll here to kind of close us out for the day. So if you are, again, willing and able and want to share, um, you know, what's your first order of business going to be related to this work after today's session? So again, you can go to slido.com 2561206 or scan the QR code there. And this is a word cloud, not a poll. I should change the slide there. <laughs> False advertising. Uh, so in the word cloud, if you want to you know, type in uh, a couple words or a short phrase there. We'll see if you all are thinking similar things or if we've got a diverse range of priorities coming out for this work. All right, so we got a lot of, a lot of responses coming in here. Great, planning, yes, always important. Planning who and how and when to get this work done. Uh, as close to July 1 as you can. And again, you have an opportunity to document if there is anything outside of the institution's control impacting your ability to meet July 1 deadline, document that thoroughly, uh, and that could be used in an enforcement action should that occur after July 1. I see quite a few about student location policy. That's great. Again, as I mentioned a few times, even more critical now with that new PPA certification responsibility. A uh, couple on the attestation process, also really important, reviewing policies. Keep plugging away. I like that. Just uh, bite by bite, right? <laughs> you gotta tackle this, tackle this work in little steps at a time. Very good. Great. Awesome. Well, again, thank you everyone for uh, participating today and for sharing information. Thanks for all of your fantastic questions. And I think, uh, I think that's all we have. I'll turn it back over to Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Chris and Nan, and for everybody joining and your wonderful questions. Um, I will be uh, making uh, contact with our communications director today and getting this up on our website and making sure that you all get a link so you can go back and review. If you have any questions, I know that Chris and Nan's uh, contact information is in the slides. Uh, again, thank you so much, and we will talk to you soon. Have a great Monday. Bye-bye. Thank you, Sarah. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.